Um, we'll discuss that in a minute. But I want to talk specifically about metabolism today. So when I ask you to do things, when I ask you to look up things, I generally say that you need to address three problems. What, what is the problem? What is being done? And why what is being done not good enough? And then generally, when you're doing research, you're looking at a new therapy, right? Or you're looking at something novel. So you're asking, why does this new thing address the problem in a different way? So I'm going to frame kind of for you one of the problems here um, with obesity. So the overall large problem with obesity is that it is on the rise in the United States. Now that is drawing a lot of attention to it because there is a lot, there are a lot of really rich people in the United States. There are a lot of very famo famous people in the United States. Um, people like Michelle Obama can draw an incredible amount of attention to an issue, right? Obesity rates are on the rise to a ridiculous degree. If you go to the, um, oh, I need another computer hooked up to the thing. Can anybody computer hook up to the thing? Uh, or if you go to the CDC right now and look at obesity rates in the United States, it shows you this white map of the United States and it starts to color in the states when obesity um, hits a certain percentage. And it just it's just taking over the country. But it's not only a United States problem now. Specifically in third world countries that are making technological advances, specifically ones like China and India, obesity rates are on a super rise there. So as far as global problems are concerned right now, we know that obesity is huge, specifically because obesity is linked to things like depression and cancer as well. So obesity becomes like this, moves from this, this idea of like a, um, hey, you should work out more to, oh crap, you're kind of going to kill yourself if you continue this behavior. And one of the most interesting questions I think about asking whenever I look at a problem like this is why would a person given a choice between obesity and not, continue on the path to obesity. So let's look. All you have to do is make a simple choice, right? Err on the side of the healthier option. Eat the salad rather than the burger, maybe. To super oversimplify this problem. So why do you choose the salad? Why do you choose the burger? Yeah. I feel like a lot of it has So you think it might be a problem with changing habits? Yeah. And with going against your um, your community, maybe, or your family, society, and their traditions. Sure. Their habits. There's also limited access to healthy foods in many regions of the world. Right. Know? So there. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, Let me just pull this up. Other than that, or nobody reports that they're obese. Mm -hmm. But it seems like they could be getting. Do you know what an epidemic is, by the way? Yeah. What's an epidemic? It's Somebody raise your hand. Yeah. It's like a large scale, like rapid spread of a problem. Okay. Um. Ah. I can't find it right now. Wait, is it like one of those? I think it's one of these, but it does it by year. And it's really cool. Wait, go down, because the other one has like tabs, not his right. down. I don't know. I don't want it broken down by ethnicity. Well, what is that one? Just like prevalence of obesity? 
Okay, I mean, so just looking at this map, this is not the map that I wanted because it doesn't show the epidemic aspect of it. It doesn't show the spread. Um, but look at this. Okay, so uh, obesity is probably defined by BMI here, body mass index, which is a height to weight ratio. Um, it's an imperfect tool, but it is one that can be administered very quickly, much like uh, heart rate. Um, but, you know, this is what? What year is this? 2015. 2015? Yeah, 2015. So we have in light green here um, states that have obesity prevalences of less than 20%. How many light green st states do you see? Maybe none. Is that possibly DC slash, Ma slash Massachusetts slash Hawaii? I see zero. Zero. <laughs> or are those the slightly darker, lighter green? Yeah, those are 20 to 25. Okay. So, one of the most important aspects of obesity is the weight and caloric sensing mechanism in the body, right? And that's one of the things that we went over, um, or at least we started to go over um, in our last class. So, I'm going to go over that one really quickly. Am I recording? Are you recording? Yes. So, this is all on tape. That's not going to look weird at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right. So, where is where is like the simplest problem? Where is hunger? Where does it live? In the brain. In your head. Does anybody know what region of the brain specifically? The what? The core. It is one of the core. I heard it. Okay. When it when you think about like basic primal emotion. So it's weird to think of hunger as an emotion, but it is. it's an emotion. Um, you're generally going to think of a, of a region of the brain called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is also more generally called the right? Yeah, very, very much so. Right, like lots of um, homeostatic behaviors. The cool thing about the hypothalamus, and the thing that you have to realize about the hypothalamus, is that it is an integration center, meaning that it receives inputs from many different places and produces some kind of output based on that information. So, the hypothalamus specifically, physiologically, it senses many things in relationship to obesity and hunger, but we talked about three basic ideas, three <laughs> basic sensing systems. Can anybody remember what they were? Am I making this all up in my head? Did we do this? Yeah. We did. Okay, so what is a leptin? Is, what, what is that a sensing mechanism for? <laughs> Close, not stomach. Leptin is not stomach. Yeah. Okay, so leptin senses, or is a sensing mechanism for simply say, stated fat. fat. Right. So, like. Abdominal fat. Um, so it's not just abdominal fat, but it turns out that this fat, for some reason, functions differently than all other types of fat in the body. For some reason, this type of fat here, the gut, the beer gut fat, is worse for you than fat, for example, that, so male, like, males try to typically get fat here, whereas females tend to get it much more over their, their entire body, and it turns out that the fat depots here are worse for you than all over your entire body. There's, I, you know what, the last time I looked at that specific issue was probably four or five years ago, and the going theory then was that it dumps into a blood vessel system much more readily than other ones, but if I put that out, and, Jeff, I'm sorry, uh, I, if I put that out, my, I feel like people that I've worked with would be really upset. Uh, so I, I don't want to say that that's really the reason, that's just what I last heard. Okay. So, what other sensing mechanism do we have? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Oh, sorry. Um, we have ghrelin, which is stomach size. Okay, stomach size. All right. And then somebody that hasn't gone yet. Yes? Insulin, which is like the sugar pancreas. Okay, insulin. 
So what is, it's sugar pancreas. Yes. Um, so blood sugar? <laughs> yeah. So we have these three uh, sensing mechanisms. And again, there are more. I'm just oversimplifying it here, right? And they output into different behaviors. All right, so there's basically a calorie, calorie craving behavior. And calorie, we'll just call it non craving behavior. Okay, so um, an aspect of this calorie non craving behavior is one that we've discussed, right? So that, that's satiety, the idea of peace or wellness. Yes? When, um, we always like talk about how like women get pregnant and they have all these like crazy food cravings. Do we know that? No, I just have heard about it. Women getting pregnant. Is that a thing? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> okay. Um, and like they have all these big crazy what? food cravings. <laughs> yes. Um, is that just because the hormones are messing with the homeostasis? Of the I have hormones? no idea. Generally, most obesity research is done on male animals specifically because you avoid fluctuations in hormonal levels so that it's easier to test. Um, but I bet you there's tons of data on that. That would be a really interesting thing. Yes? So, like, I heard that you are used to, like, feeling satiated at a certain calorie intake love threshold, but then you, like over time start eating more and more calories, eventually that threshold will change. Right? right, so that's let's talk about that really quickly. So all three of these systems in the hypothalamus in general is a really good example, is an awesome example of this idea called negative feedback. Okay, so uh, do you want the metaphor or the real version first? Real. real version. Okay, so in a negative feedback system, um, You have the idea of set point. Okay? This can change. Set point can change. But what it is, is that it is the level at which, if you sense at this level, there will be no reaction of the system. There will be no correction. So the set point is the level of no correction. If you drop below the set point, the system corrects upward. And if you go above the set point, the system corrects downward. So, for example, in the case of leptin, if there is a satiety set point, there's a, oh, like a fat sensing set point. If you lose fat, your body will produce less leptin. Specifically, your white adipose tissue will produce less leptin. That will travel to your brain, producing this signal, this, this, this recording that says, you know, low level, and the body will correct with an output that says increase level. Again, so you become hungry and you start to consume food. We've seen this in the case of that child that had the leptin uh, mutation that produced a non-functional leptin. And you saw how that child became obese very quickly and once corrected, became unobese. Unobese? I don't like, so the, t the term is normal. I don't like the term. I, I feel like for humans, that's just a really bad, especially humans in San Francisco. All right, the other side of it is a high level sense. Okay, so on the right side of this graph, we have a sensing.
And on the left side, we have an output. This is what the body senses. This is the response. In case of feeding behavior, in case of metabolism, oftentimes that, font, that response is going to be eat or don't eat. Um, there's going to be a lot of accessory responses like raise body temperature or increase activity. Yes? So if you started eating too much and then it says output of a decrease level, that going to start eating, then how do you get this big rate of like obesity in the United States? What right. Levels of stuff? Right. So let me teach you the system first. A little bit in a little bit more detail and then I'll start to talk you talk to you about dysregulation and a couple of really cool experiments that kind of highlight um, the problem all right so you may want to remember this but a great way to think of negative feedback systems is driving so imagine you're driving on a road a three-lane highway you're supposed to maintain the middle lane you are in the middle lane so your hand is straight the road curves a little bit or your hand accidentally moves, something happens, you start to veer a little bit to the left. You notice your car traveling over the white line. You correct by going right. Same would happen. So let's say you overcorrect. Now you veer over to the right side. You cross the line again. Your brain says correct and you go left. So a negative feedback system, and this is going to be important for you to write down because you're going to make this mistake. A negative feedback system does not decrease the amount of anything. A negative feedback system corrects in the opposite direction. That might be up and that might be down. People think that because it says negative, it means down. It just means in the opposite direction. So if you travel left, you correct right. If you travel right, you correct left. My question then to you would be, how would a positive feedback system look in my driving metaphor? Yes, Alex? Correct the same way. So what would it look like? It would correct. Run me through the steps. So if you're doing too much, it would give you more? Okay. I need you to use, so in, a, in a, any kind of feedback system, you need to use the term set point and sensing. Can you show, want to try it now? Uh, Luce? So if you're in the middle lane and the second you're in the lane, right. you veer to the left. Okay. And you're sensing that you're going to the left, and in response you veer more to the left. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Um, so the two, and we're going to be adult about this, but the two most common examples, physiological examples, of a positive feedback system are the uh, orgasm and uh, pregnancy. Um, with pushing. Pushing. Is that the word? Contractions. Uh, okay. So we've talked about leptin, but let's go to it. Let's break it down really quickly. So the leptin system is going to be white adipose tissue sensing. White adipose tissue. What? What? Are you asking me a question right now? No, no. Okay, all right. Okay. So, um, very simply stated, you have to have white adipose tissue. It's going to produce leptin. Do you know what the process by which we make proteins, what that is called? Transcription and translation. Say again. Everybody mumble at the same time, so I believe that you, you're right. <laughs> yes, uh, gene expression is the overall process, but transcription and translation are two major parts of it. Um, okay, so the white adipose tissue travels to leptin. The sensor in the brain is going to be the leptin receptor. which is going to live on neurons in the hypothalamus. Um, 
One very important part is the arcuate nucleus. I don't know, that's not important. Don't worry about it. Hypothalamus. Okay. So this leptin receptor, sometimes called LEPR or OBRB um, for obesity receptor, uh, is in the hypothalamus. Uh, can you pull up on canvas the diagram that I posted? Okay. So the body is going to correct, or the brain is going to correct by producing generally one of two hormones. POMC or NPY. POMC stands for pro opio melanocortin. Um, when created, it, when, sorry, it, all we need to know is that it makes you satisfied. satisfied. Yes. So if you go to the modules. No. Uh, uh, brain map hungry. Uh, pro opio melanocortin. The really interesting part in that is the opio part, I think. Okay, so nobody freak out. <coughs> All right. So here is the brain. This is the hypothalamus. It kind of sits on this little gap right in the middle here, this little hole thing. Okay. <coughs> How's everybody doing? I see the hypothalamus. Thumbs. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, leptin is going to bind to receptors on two different places. Thumbs. What does leptin bind to? Receptors. The leptin receptors. Places. Okay. Great. So there's two populations of neurons that are particularly interesting to us, right? So NPY and POMC. So leptin has a positive effect on POMC neurons, which are going to produce satiety. Whereas NPY neurons are going to produce hunger. Because a lack of satiety is not always hunger. All right. So leptin, and this is the important. This is an important part. Leptin will have a positive effect on POMC and a negative effect on NPY. So the way I can write this in like super bio terms is Watt produces leptin and leptin has a positive effect on POMC and a negative effect on NPY. When you say positive and negative effect, it's a positive means it produces, produces more of that. But a negative effect, it's not like it's pulling out of the system. No, it will cause a decrease in production, usually. Okay. Good, very good question. All right. So then the question is, why do people become obese? Well, we saw the case of the obesity gene problem, right? But that is actually an incredibly like low number of people have that. Like really, really low. And according to our math, do a really, really low numbers of people have this obesity problem? Mm -mm. No. So something is causing a leptin resistance. 
And we're going to see this over and over again. But basically, a leptin resistance is an insensitivity to leptin. You produce a large amount of leptin. What's supposed to happen? Pom C is supposed to be activated. NPY becomes negatively activated, right? You shut down hunger levels. You increase satiety. What should happen? You stop eating because you're you not stop hungry. Stop eating. Somehow, the system becomes insensitive to the production of leptin. We know the leptin is being produced. We know the person is still eating. Something in the system changed. Yes? The way you have a type 2 diabetes involves the resistance to insulin. Is it a yes. similar mechanism? Uh, it is a similar concept. The mechanism could be different. Okay. Right? So we can do this many ways. We can decrease the amount of leptin receptors on the surface of the cell. We can decrease the effectiveness of the leptin. We can change the set point. Set point. Like There's many ways to achieve the leptin resistance. The important point of the end here is that in obesity we achieve a leptin resistance. We know two things right off the bat will cause this leptin resistance. One, age. Two, high calorie diet. There's some debate as to whether sugar will do this more or less than other groups, or fat will do this more or less than other groups. Um, this, this is like the question in fitness magazines right now. Right? Because if you can increase calories and increase resistance or decrease resistance, then you're going to have a person that self-corrects. But also people are wondering like, what is it that is destroying people? So you know you see this kind of question of like, is it high sugars, like lots of sugars in a child's diet that are causing the leptin resistance? Yes. So, so high calorie diet, is that in relation to it's in relation to like output? Like is it sort of mapped into burning eighteen thousand calories a day? So yes, this is, this is, you know, that's a really good question. I don't, so I, I've never worked with athletic mice. Great. <laughs> so I don't know the answer to that. But I don't, no, I think that you're, I think that in a high calorie athlete, athlete you're preserving the system. The set point is changing. Yeah. You don't develop the resistance. I think that what would happen is if the athlete stopped working out. And then, yeah, and then maintain the high calorie diet, the system would break. Mm -hmm. So this resistance is not a change in just set point. This, this system is, this resistance is a break in the system. This system changes to disease level. Right? So that's like an important idea too. There's no, there's no quick fix for this. All right. How much time have I gone? Am I going too fast on pace? Good. Good. Fast, too slow, just right. You can go just right. Okay. I've got a mixture of just right and a little too slow. Okay. So insulin should be one that we're slightly more familiar with. Um, let's go ahead and maybe start with the... Um, My lovely computer person. Everybody, Hannah. Okay. Um, so interestingly, insulin uh, has what effect on NPY? Take a look at the map. See if you can break it down. Find insulin. Okay, talk in your groups, see if you can break down the behavioral effect of insulin on the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. Yeah, it seems to be the same as leptin, right? Yeah. 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 
positive effect. What is it? What is the effect of if I so what will be the effect if I increase insulin in a person? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's be a little more specific. Will it? You said it will decrease hunger. Okay, so it'll decrease hunger, but what will it also do? It'll increase satiety, right? Okay. Cool. Um, all right. So then let's just break down the insulin system really quickly. So. What is the major, major producer of insulin? The pancreas. Okay, so pancreas. In response to high glucose levels in the blood, produces the signal insulin. Anybody want to guess what the sensor for the insulin is in the brain? Yeah, insulin receptor. Uh, does anybody want to try it in Spanish? El receptor insulino. No. El insulin receptor. <laughs> Don't get ahead of yourself. Anyone gonna try in French? Yes. Yeah. yeah, try it with a little more arrogance. What's your baguette? Yeah. I speak French better than my dad. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah but you clear, you don't have a cigarette or a baguette, so you're clearly not French. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have insulin receptors. Ints are in the hypothalamus. Now, this dysregulation has been much more studied, I think, than leptin re uh, regulation. So the guy, the leptin receptor guy is Jeffrey Friedman, or the leptin guy is Jeffrey Friedman. Um, Interestingly, he named leptin after, it was originally called the obesity compound, and he uh, named it after the Greek god leptos. Um, and he was, he was the student of the woman who kind of came up with the idea that chemicals control the brain. Like, so there's this woman named Mary Jane Creek, uh, and Jeffrey Friedman, who discovered leptin, yeah, you don't care. When was that? When was, I don't but know. He had it when did she have it? Yeah, like when was that? Like 40 years ago, when when did, was it accepted? 10, 10, 15 years ago, I think. Right, like, so, I mean, the idea of the brain, uh, the brain-mind dichotomy still exists, and exists in lots of medicine, right? So people are like, oh, we're going to treat the physical symptoms or the medical sim or the mental symptoms. I feel like there is merit to that distinction, though, purely because we we don't have like the technology that presents enough to really treat the small things. Okay. But. Yes, I agree. I agree. We currently don't know how to. We cannot like pharmacologically produce talk yes. therapy. Right. And we've also seen like physiological effects of talk therapy. Yeah. I'm not saying, but so that, that there is, there very quite clearly could be a physical mechanism to that, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to get into this argument. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, and, and, but I'm saying that doesn't... Right. Ab absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, in insulin, in insulin dysregulation, uh, and diabetes can lead to obesity, obesity can lead to diabetes. The two are linked. Um, as a matter of fact, everything we're seeing today are going, is, is going to be linked. Everything in the whole body is linked. Yes. When you say diabetes, are you talking about a specific type of uh, So a obesity, a obesity phenotype will lead to insulin resistance. Okay. Hey.
I was supposed to teach today anyway. I know, but so we see dysregulation in this system in two very specific classes that someone creatively named type one one two and type one or in French lay type one <laughs> Clearly a good idea that you weren't in class yeah. there, right? <laughs> All right. So um, the interesting thing is that just like in obesity, in the obesity phenotype where we have this low population or this low number of problems producing leptin that leads, that leads to obesity, in this case, we have problems producing insulin in type 1. So basically, anything that obliterates your ability to produce insulin is going to be considered type 1, so that will range for a virus that knocks out your pancreas to a uh, mutation in the insulin gene. Um, the insulin gene is actually one of the most robust proteins, or produces like the super robust proteins, so it's really, really hard to mess with. Yes. Yeah, and I believe uh, insulin therapy was one of the first. Trip, correct me if I'm wrong. It was one. Uh, diabetes was one of the first diseases that they tried to correct through genetic therapy, so fixing the gene directly. But it sort of screwed up. So the thing that they used, the microinjector that they used for the gene, um, ended up taking over the body. Am I? I don't know that one. Uh, so they used a virus in it, and it was a problem. Okay, so. The much more common type of dysregulation in this system, in the insulin system, the sugar in the blood sensing system, is a resistance. And this one develops rapidly, like days. This is type 2. But let's use, I prefer we use more technical term. I think we should use the term like the resistance problem versus the, the, the signal problem, right? So if we have a problem making the signal, that is different than a resistance in the sensing system. All right? Um, you know what would be great? Should I just set so over this there? reached, yeah. <laughs> All right, can somebody help me with the ghrelin problem? I always screw up the ghrelin level. Uh, does, can, I know we looked this up last time. More ghrelin means... More ghrelin means more stomach stretching. Is that right? Yeah. Let's look that up. No, yeah, so stomach stretching leads to less ghrelin. That's what we... That, your part is a problem now. Okay. So, in the stomach sensing system, um, less ghrelin means stomach stretched. Ghrelin interacts with this system the, the similarly, but it can actually do it in two ways. I'm not. I can. So your stomach can directly communicate with your brain through a nerve, um, but it can also produce a hormone. Not, not important. The idea here, again, is going to be the idea of the negative feedback system. The thing that is going to be produced is ghrelin. The thing that is going to be producing it is the stomach. It's going to go back. It's going to interact with the system. And for some reason, in American populations specifically, there's going to be a breakdown in the system. Similarly, a resistance. So... Now we're looking at metabolism. We're looking at the way you process food and three sensing mechanisms. We have, they all function similarly. So there's this area of the body. It gets bigger or smaller in the case of the stomach. It gets more or less in the case of fat. It gets more or less sugar in the case of insulin. 
those signals all travel back to an area in the brain called the hypothalamus. It acts as an integration center, and it puts out this basically kind of two-pronged behavior, which is going to be, am I uh, satisfied or not satisfied? Am I hungry or not hungry? Not satisfied and hungry produces a behavior in human beings, which is food-seeking behavior. Kind of cool, right? No? Are you dead? Do we need a break? Do we need question time? Yeah, please. How much of a simplification is this? Seven. Okay. I don't know what that means. Like, like how, this seems like an awfully simple explanation. I spent, I I spent three and a half years working on the step directly after leptin, leptin binding. Mm -hmm and what happened to the leptin receptor. Okay. Is it, but are there like nuances that you aren't telling us about that would... Oh god, like, yes. Okay. And, and how much do they... But is this like fairly representative simplification? So I think, I, I think the, the way of maybe answering that question is right now that you kind of know how to fix obesity with the way I just explained this to you. Right. Right? So if you just administered somebody leptin then on top of like any leptin that they were already producing, then they should not eat, right? Right. That doesn't work. Okay. So it, it's, it is a problem of epidemiological proportion. Right. It is affecting every state in the United States. It is hugely affecting China. It is hugely affecting India. It is such a big problem that it links directly to things like cancer and depression, and yet we don't have a solution for it. So when you asked me how nuanced is the actual thing, the answer is that every major research institution is working on this in some way, and there is not a solution. But isn't the goal of like having a pill you can take that you will get from the sort of there are many ways of people have tried to treat this. So there's actually an electromagnetic hat that you can wear that tries to shut down the hypothalamus. Um, I mean, people try everything. Just go out. Let me pick up a magazine. Pick up a pick up a woman's health magazine. Those are awesome. I love those. All all young females should read those all the time. Um, because they're just horrible, like made up things of how to treat this. But you can also just have a person eat less right over time and the set point will decrease, right? That works. No. Does it? Tell a person to eat less and what happens? Do they? Do they? No. Well, if, if it means that, like saving their health, then so, so, I mean, like, that, that's back to my original question, though, right? Like, so let's, the question is, like, I have two people in front of me. One is morbidly obese. We're not talking, we're not talking, like, has trouble, like, with looking at themselves in the mirror or getting into the prom dress or whatever. We're saying, like, you're going to develop a disease. You're going to die earlier. You're quality of life is going to decrease. You need to eat less. That is my solution. That is my prescription. Eat less. That verbal command. And yet it doesn't work. So the question is why? Because it's hard to come back at very simple things. Because it's part of the society. It is going to be much more complicated and biological than people appreciate. Yeah. But if, if you do, I'm not saying like it's easy to do, but if you're like literally just not given access to more food, you do always lose weight, right? No. No? No. Two people given, two people with different metabolism systems, and this is the part I was about to go to. So two people with different metabolisms, you can give them the same amount of calories and they will, and the same amount of exercise, the same and everything. And they will retain and have different amounts of weight loss. So 
So, but if you decrease. Hold, so hold on one second. So let me just show you this. So from the hypothalamus, I said the most common thing, the most common output is feeding behavior. But let's look at some other things. The hypothalamus also helps you regulate things like body temperature. What happens to a person with higher body temperature? Where are they getting that temperature from? They're burning those calories faster. Let's look at... How long food spends in your actual body? If food spends less time in your body, guess what you have less ability to do? You have fewer, you have less time to absorb the nutrients. <laughs> right? Yes? I feel like this part of why your differences aren't what's causing it. Because, I mean, these have been present for thousands of years and have had more these big problems. Yeah, that's a really good question. Kind of has a question. Can you starve to go fat? Can you starve to go fat? While you're fat, if you're starving. Or will you deflate and there's a slower starving? The question is, can you... <laughs> so, you can block a person's ability to... There are poisons which block a person's ability to break down fat. So, yes, you could. You could die from calorie... So, you could die from calorie starvation even though you had calorie reserves. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Oh, yes. without the poison? So you so like, okay, okay. I, this, I love these questions, but let me let me get, let me break. I've taught you too well. You, you're, you're asking the questions that I want you to ask, but I want to give you the background first. So I need to give you just like two more points here, and then let me show you a very weird scenario. Um, and it will help to kind of show this. Oh, I already put activity on here. Um, okay, so we've talked about the hypothalamus in outputting behaviors that aren't just feeding behaviors, right? So body temp, gastric emptying, activity. What if your ability to move is directly like influenced by the hypothalamus? Like period, your ability to move. What if you have a decreased ability to actually move? What if the connection between a thought of moving and actually moving was decreased? So you're like, I'm going to go run. But there's something in between I'm going to go run and run that is somehow affected by this. Right? Um, and then you have contributions to things like depression. Yes? When you say that it seems linked to depression, is there any causal relationship there? Yes. Do you know what the link is? Yeah. Small chemical. Serotonin? Nope. Starts with a cortisol. Cortisol. Right. How do you get So that is one link. Yeah. Okay. So. One thing that Mand and I realized we forgot to talk about in kind of our previous class was the link of a new idea in, in systems that affect your body. And that's the question or the, the concept of epigenetics. Has anybody heard that term before? Yes, I've heard the term. Don't know what it means, but I've heard it. Then just put your thumb up. Okay, Paulina? Oh my god, Paulina. <laughs> Stop knowing stuff. All right. Okay. So, not all you know what this term epigenetics means. Let's break it down really quickly. This is what? Say it all in unison right now. Yeah. In French. 
In Spanish. L D N A O. Thank you. L D N A O. Okay. So if you look at this DNA closely, you'll notice that there's basically two types of connections in the middle. There are two types. There are types with three little linkers, and there are types with two little linkers. Okay, that altering, altering basically levels or uh, the sequence of threes and twos in the DNA molecule is what we call genetics. Right? So you could have like three, 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 two, three. And that would be one thing. And then three, three, two. Two is a different thing. Okay, you pass on that sequence to your children. And you cannot change it no matter how many times you go to Vegas. Because Vegas is a metaphor for debauchery and drugs and overeating and all the other things that you can do in that you shouldn't do that I don't have to list out every time. Okay, so interestingly, Mark. Okay. So interestingly, how embarrassing would it be if I couldn't put this back on? Is it embarrassing? Shut up. Totally a biology teacher. Okay, so um, interestingly, this backbone of DNA doesn't contain a code. This one is the same as this one, is the same as this one, is the same as this one, is the same as this one. But I can actually alter it by chemically putting on things. And that can shut down my ability to access the inside of this DNA. So I have to be able to access this face in order to read it. Somehow I have to get into that link, those twos and threes in there. Now, if I shut down the ability to access that, I've shut down the ability to read this gene. Is the gene still there? Yeah, absolutely. Can I read it? No. So functionally, it's kind of like having a book of code, but having stuck pages. So the information is there. I can't access it. Epigenetics gives us a clue to the mechanism of the current third world problem. So it was found that in third world countries, there are two populations. Parents that have had kind of low calorie intake all their life, and then children which have had, who have had high calorie access. In the, like McDonald's and such. Right? So you have moved from a situation where you're basically on a calorie-restricted diet all your life to a situation where you have a high-calorie diet. Now, the genetics of those two people are essentially the same. The same population is getting married and producing children. There's not a lot of it, mixture in between, like, you know, children that were born, like my age children, right? So, like, there's not a whole lot of Indian, Asian or Indian white or Indian whatever mixes, right? So it seems as though something happened to the epigenetics of those two groups in that my generation is super susceptible to high calorie diets. For some reason, I, if I eat calories, will put on weight more rapidly than my parents. Now our genetics, again, are essentially the same. So it's not genetics that explains it. It's not environment, specifically, because in this case we're both eating high calorie diets. We're both doing the same amount of exercise. And several experiments were done, basically, in which they transplanted uh, organisms while still in the womb. Um, and what that showed is that the environment in which you grow up, whether it be a low calorie or calorically restricted system or a high calorie system, will influence your epigenetics and that will influence everything about your system. So we have 
in addition to the ability to change the genes, right? So we have like in obesity problems or metabolism problems, we can say, oh, there was an insulin gene problem. We can say you overate and changed your set point. But we also now have what I call a vagus problem, where if you lead a lifestyle that is unhealthy, you actually alter your ability to access genes on your DNA. And I'm oversimplifying ridiculously. But you, these changes are different because you can actually pass some of these changes onto your children and they're chemical, so they last a very long time. People wonder why I freak out a lot when I see children eating like tons of pizza. And I'm like, I see something that you don't, right? Like leading, I am not advocating for never eating pizza, but I'm from Chicago. Right, so I, I think the important thing, for me at least, is that you give yourselves a chance at this metabolism system, like not screwing up this aspect of it uh, right now, because your, particular, your, your epigenetics are particularly susceptible right now and while you're young. So is this challenging Brown's theory that your girls and Brown's Yes, like yes. This is, some people will argue that this is a Lamarckian idea, the, the stretchy giraffe neck mm -hmm. guys. Um, if you want to look more into this, didn't I give somebody a project in epigenetics in this class? No? All right, just kidding. If you really are interested in this, you can email me, and I'll send you a project I wrote on epigenetics, and it'll take you through what it is and how it works, and it's linked to cancer, obesity, and addiction. Okay, so the difference between this class and the class that we, I taught before was in the last class we talked only about the calorie sensing mechanism or the, the mechanisms by which your body is aware of what you are eating and how to regulate it. It's a highly tuned system. You, you can Done. 